Welcome to the Online Success Journey Podcast, your opportunity to discover and learn from entrepreneurs like yourself. This is not your typical podcast, but a place where you can get the real story and find out how real people encounter speed bumps and detours, but journey through to find success. Now here's your host for the Online Success Journey Podcast, Patience. Hello everyone and welcome to Online Success Journey. This is episode 128. Are you ready to join the clan? Today we have Richard Chappell. Richard is a business lawyer who has been practicing for 25 years. He advises small and large online businesses on how best to comply with law applicable to conducting business online such as the DMCA and FTC regulations. Hello, Richard. Hello, patients. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming. I know the clan is anxious to hear your story, so let's get started with the basics. Can you tell my clan a little bit about your background, about what you did before you started your own online business? Uh, sure. I'm uh, born and raised in San Diego, California, and um, got into law fairly early, actually. I uh, became a lawyer when I was 25, and actually worked in a litigation field known as wrongful death, which was basically we defended hospitals and doctors uh, when patients passed away. Uh, and there was claim negligence and things of that sort. And then then roughly 1999, uh, 2000, um, I had a friend who had uh, become CEO of an internet company at that time. And uh, I was burning out on law, um, burning out on what I was doing. And so uh, he asked me to help that, that business. And the next thing you know, I was working in the internet law field, which was fairly exciting because at that point, uh, if you think back to then, the internet as a commercial medium, at least, was still pretty young. Uh, and there were a lot of open questions about uh, how issues like copyright and uh, people sharing information and how all of that was going to work from a legal perspective. Um, much of the law is pretty settled. Um, you know, in the traditional brick and mortar world. Uh, so it was nice to kind of get into areas where people were looking at something new. Why do you do what you do? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, in switching over to internet law, you know, one of the, the main reasons that I picked it and have stuck with it is that uh, a lot of the um, legal environment that lawyers work in is what I call destructive, which is basically uh, it, it deals with conflict and things of that sort. Uh, the nature of this business, at least in what I do, is mostly um, very positive. You know, it's helping uh, my clients who tend to start out pretty small, um, you know, avoid any kind of legal problems. Uh, and it's nice to just sort of watch them grow over the years. And so, you know, I, most of my clients have been with me for quite a quite some time. And, you know, you see them grow from a little home office, um, you know, into something that's substantial where they're taking down commercial real estate and what have you and, and becoming fairly successful. And, you know, that's really, really nice to watch and frankly, pretty inspiring to see, you know, some of these people uh, take ideas that I originally looked at and thought, hmm, uh, <laughs> and turn it into something, uh, you know, that, that's really kind of a life dream for them. Wow. Okay, let's put man aside because you're already uh, in business for a long time, for over 25 years before you moved on to internet law. How did you know you are, you are successful? How do I know I'm successful? Yeah, when you um, made a move, the internet you Hello. Oh well, um, when I made the move, I was it was you know like most people I think starting a new a new business you kind of have to take the leap uh, and so certainly there was some concern there about <laughs> how it would turn out. Uh, I was I was just so sick of my old job, um, you know that it was really I was, I was kind of forced to do it. You know there was just no way I could continue. And then once I got into it, um, you know I was shocked at kind of it was unique at that time because internet law was such a new concept uh, there just weren't, weren't very many people doing it uh, and so um, I, I, you know once I started or got out quickly and suddenly I was getting inundated with um, you know requests from people about things that I knew nothing about so for instance um, you know they're the mugshot websites uh, that you'll see and people want to get their mugshots taken down and you know I had no idea no experience with any of that law or anything of that sort. Um, but it ended up, you know, becoming something that people were contacting me about all the time. And, um, so, you know, I think as that started to roll along, you get a feeling like, okay, I can do this and the business is going to be successful. And then it's a matter of kind of thinking about, um, you know, your lifestyle, 
how much do you want to work? Um, how do you balance your lifestyle? Lawyers traditionally have been very, very poor at it. <laughs> we have a large, you know, high levels of alcoholism and every other ism you can think of um, because we, we're generally not good at that. But uh, I've really tried to um, you know, make an effort to do that. So, you know, I think once I got to that point and um, where I could control my schedule and I had enough clients that it wasn't a big issue, I kind of felt like, okay, this is successful and we can move forward. And uh, it's worked out pretty well. Why should you never tell your visitors you will not to sell or share uh, their personal information? Oh, uh, so if you have a website and uh, you're collecting information from people, um, you have to think about the value of that website. So if one day you ever want to sell it, um, you know, what are you going to be selling? What is somebody who's interested in buying your online business going to be purchasing? And a lot of time, a lot of times the value, the maximum value that they're going to be looking at is your client list or your email list. That has you know a large amount of value to them. Well, if you promise to your users that you can't, uh, that you won't sell or share or rent their information, um, you know you're going to have problems selling it uh, because you've just told them that you haven't. And we've actually seen court cases on it. One involved a company called Radio Shack. Another one involved a dating site called True.com. Uh, True.com's parent company had some problems and they were dragged into bankruptcy. Uh, and so another dating site called Plenty of Fish came along and, and thought, hmm. I see an opportunity here. They tried to purchase um, the member database for True.com. They were going to add it to their own database. And for dating sites, obviously having you know as many people in your database as possible makes you more attractive uh, you know, to potential users. And in that case, uh, a number of states in the United States objected to the transaction because they said that True.com had promised their users that they wouldn't sell or share or rent their information. Uh, and a court upheld that and invalidated the sale of the member database, I think the sale price was $700,000, something along that lines. And so that database became basically you know, without value because they couldn't move it. Um, and in a dating site, you know, the value is the member database. It's not the design or the logo or anything of that sort. Um, so it really killed the value of that business. So even though most people are being noble when they make that statement to people who come to their sites, you, know, you have to be careful and think it through, um, you know, so you're not cutting off your own knees at you know, the time you want to sell the site. So that's kind of the problem with that. So what can we use instead of saying that word then? Because most of the companies, they do say, we are not going to sell your name or your personal information. And all you know, you find other companies sending you things and you're like, mm, hang on a minute. How did they find that? So <laughs> yes. how can we really play around it and just be not, not obvious, but <laughs> just you're, hang around in the a... background <laughs> to make sure you're... we keep value in our website to our membership. No, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I was laughing. I was on a site once. I was looking for, I was thinking about buying a Toyota truck. And I don't know what happened, but for literally like three weeks after that, I, all day, I was inundated by emails from Asian dating sites for some reason. I have no idea how I got into that. But um, yeah, well, a lot of people, yeah, they do share their information, even though they will say that. Um, the way you can legally get around that is you just include a statement saying, you know, however, if we sell the site or the business, um, you know, your assets, your personal information is going to be transferred. As part of that sale, um, and, you know, and unfortunately now you also really need to use, you know, at least run it by a privacy lawyer um, because we're seeing privacy law become much more strict. Um, you know, you there in the UK, you're dealing with the general data protection regulation, which goes into effect in May, which is a very, very strict um, privacy law. And so transferring data uh, from one company to another, um, you have to be careful now about whether you can do it, how you can do it, what can be transferred, what cannot be transferred. Um, so you have to be a little careful there. But generally, including a statement you know, that if, if the business is sold, um, you know, the, the personal information of people will be an asset is, is you know, generally the way you want to go with it. Okay, you are now experienced in the internet law. If we mention that, uh, oh, however, we are going to be transferring your information in the future once we want to sell, are we not going to scare people coming to be members on our site or becoming our customers? Are we not going to scare them away? In your experience, what have you seen? With that uh, in, my, in my experience, no, um, because people are going to provide that information um, because they want something or they're interested in the side of the service. And the interesting thing about privacy law that I found, at least from representing businesses, is while politicians and regulatory groups are, are greatly interested in privacy and you have some niche associations who are very interested in it, the vast majority of consumers, at least particularly in the United States, don't seem to care. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's amazing what they'll agree to. Um, <laughs> 
and and again, it's part of it's you know we're in a, we live in a different age. Um, you know, if you went back to the pre-internet, let's say the 1980s, the idea that a business would share most of its trade secrets, you know, with the general public that that you know so that other competitors could see it, it would have been a laughable concept. But if we go to where we are now with social media. You know, you'll have um, you know people who are established business people, uh, marketing gurus, whatever. You know, they go out and they do talks and videos, and and they don't hold back, and they release a lot of the trade secrets. Um, you know, you look at Elon Musk. Uh, you know, for some of the technology they developed around Tesla. Um, you know, they're not they're not holding those patents. They're telling people you can use these uh, without paying us. Um, you know, if you as so long as you're developing you know this particular technology. That's something you would never have seen in the past. Um, so people's expectations of privacy, I think, has changed quite a bit. I mean, you look at Facebook or Instagram. You know, Instagram, people post their whole life up there. Um, so the idea that somebody's collecting that information and selling it, yeah, it aggravates a certain percentage of the population. But it's pretty surprising how small it is. Um, and so my clients, I can tell you, we, we just really haven't seen any big drop-off when you make those kinds of statements, you know, that we are going to collect your information and we will sell it as part of – you know, a transaction. I think the one area where you do see some some fight back is if you um, tell them you're going to sell it, um, you know, sell their content. So Instagram, for instance, uh, Instagram a couple of years ago uh, changed their their policies and they said basically when you post a picture, we have the right to sell it to advertisers for use, and that got a big backlash. Um, but I think if you do anything short of that, you know, you'd be surprised. You just don't really see a huge backlash from users. So are you saying now nowadays um, people are going on social media on the internet they are relaxed on their details? Yes. Yes. I mean it's amazing what people will post. <laughs> I I give you extreme examples of it. Mm -hmm. Um criminal think about criminals. Um there are cases in, in all over Europe, all over the US, uh where criminals or drug dealers or whatever, they go online and post what they're doing on their Facebook page or their you know, or they do Snapchat or whatever it is. And they're just, I'm, you know, and the police haul them down and, you know, arrest them and everything. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, what do you think? Regardless of the criminal activity, you know, why would you possibly put that out in the public? Um, it's just a different mentality. And, um, you know, in some ways that's good. In some ways it's not so hot. Um, but, you know, it starts having ramifications that I think people don't really think about. So if somebody goes online and they talk about, you know, they, they're sick or you know, whatever it is, um, what you're going to see is, you know, health insurance companies start looking at that data. They're buying data, you know, on what people are posting about their health, um, you know, and all this information gets out there and it has some practical uh, impact on people's lives when their insurance premiums go up or an employer sees you, you know, post your images from going to, uh, you know, Greece for a week and, you know, getting crazy or whatever. Um, and so, so you can have, you know, real backlash from that. And I don't think a lot of people really think that through. So in that sense, it is a problem. What is the DMCA and how do you use it online to address copywriting issues? So the DMCA is a federal law in the United States. It deals with copyright and really only applies to the U S. Um, it only applies to the U S. Um, but the U.S. is the biggest consumer market, so a lot of other countries, hosts and what have you, will, will uh, comply with it. Basically what it says is that a website um, can have uh, immunity from uh, copyright infringement claims based on anything the users upload. So if you think, again, about Facebook, that's kind of the classic. Um, if somebody goes out and they see an article they like on uh, The Guardian and they copy it and they put it onto their Facebook page, well, that's copyright infringement. Um, under the DMCA, Facebook is not liable for that, um, but uh, the person who posted it is. And so if you have a site uh, and people are stealing your content, which if you have a website, people are stealing your content. It's pretty common these days. Um, it's a way to go ahead and try to get people to um, take down that content. So you can contact – one of the best ways to do it is you look for their, their host – um, so you do a uh, who has search for their domain. And once that occurs, you're going to see and the results come back. You're going to see a host listed down there. It's often uh, NS1 dot something. Um, you can do a search for that on Google and it will pull up the host. And then at that point, you can contact the host and you can submit what's called a takedown notice. And what you're saying to them is, hey, this site that you're hosting is stolen my content. Here's the link to the original content that I created. Here's a link to the page where they copied it and you take a few other basic steps and the host will take down that content. Uh, it's, so it's a good way of keeping um, you know, your, your stolen content um, 
you know, from getting up and hurting your business. So a lot of people are using it from that perspective. How do you avoid the copywriting letter from a lawyer? Well, so um, <laughs> copyright's been around for hundreds of years, um, obviously well before the internet existed and doesn't always translate well um, to the internet. Um, basically, if you're going to use content from some other source other than you created it, you need to think about where did I get this? Uh, a lot of people will go out and they will copy images or pictures um, and put it on their websites and say it's a new website uh, or they copy videos or anything of that sort. And they'll just use them on their sites without thinking about copyright. Well, in most instances, um, you know, that's a violation of copyright law. It's called copyright infringement, and you can be sued. And depending on how the lawsuit proceeds, you know, there can be damages against you for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you can be responsible for paying the attorney fees of the other party. What happens in reality is typically you, you receive a letter um, in the U.S. Probably the company most famous for sending out these letters is um, Getty Images. And they will send what's called a cease and desist letter. And the letter says, you know, this is a photo that we have the rights to. You republished it on your website or your app without uh, authorization. Um, you know, you need to take it down immediately. And, oh, we want $5,000 in damages. Uh, so this was kind of a panic moment for most businesses or most people who have websites. Uh, and you have to, you know, deal with that situation. Um, sometimes you know, you're going to have to pay, sometimes you're not. It really depends on you know, what rights they have to that, that photo. Um, so the way to avoid that is just think about, well, what right do I have to use this? Um, there are a couple myths that, that get people into trouble. Um, one myth is I can use a photo or an article or graphic or whatever so long as I link back to the source. That is not correct. Linking back to the source is called attribution, and that's a defense to a plagiarism claim. Uh, it is not a defense to copyright infringement. Uh, and so people who are doing that, not only are they um, not protecting themselves from a copyright infringement claim, but they're making it more likely you know, that they're going to have problems because the person who posted that original content will be able to see in their stats and their um, analytics that there's a link from a site that's using their content. Um, so <laughs> it's something you have to be very careful about. Uh, now, social media, of course, again, makes things a little bit interesting and, the, and overall the sharing nature of the web. If a, um, a party is you know, has put up um, buttons or links or things of that sort that allows you to share, then you can go ahead and use it. Um, but you have to – it's always best to read the license just to make sure that you're using it correctly. So let's use an example. YouTube. Uh, if somebody joins YouTube and they create a video and they upload a video – can you take that video and copy it to your website? Well, it depends. Uh, under the YouTube terms and conditions, that person uh, typically is granting you a license uh, to go ahead and use it. However, they can reject that, and what they do is they make it um, uh, what I would call unshareable. So when you're looking at a YouTube video, they always have that button, you know, share. You click it, and it gives you a link or an embed code that you can use to put it on your site. If that link is active, that means you can use it. Uh, but if that link is not active, then you cannot use that video. They've not given you the rights to do that. Um, so it's kind of an important distinction, something you know that people want to pay attention to. Same thing with photos um, or articles or memes or anything else. Um, you know, if there are share buttons there, if there's the you know the Facebook or Twitter or whatever you, then you, you can go ahead and use it. If it's not there, then you can't copy it and do that. Um, so those kind of the distinction that you have to look for um, when online. What uh, common mistakes have you seen into internet uh, businesses? Well, I think when people start a business, um, you know, one of the most important things to realize is it's, it's sort of a marriage. I mean, when if you have partners, you're essentially getting married. Um, you're probably going to be spending more time with those partners than you, you may with your spouse. Um, but part of that is uh, at the outset when there's really no money on hand, you're not making any money. Um, one of the most important things to do that a lot of people don't do is they want to you want to create – what's called a founder's agreement, uh, depending on the type of business entity you use, it may be called something different. Um, but it's an agreement in writing that basically says, here's how the business is going to be run, and here are the expectations for each of the people, each of the founders who's starting the business. And if they don't meet these expectations, uh, what happens? So can you fire that person? Do they lose their ownership percentage? Um, you know, all these different things. And there are different strategies for dealing with that. But the important thing is you want to have it in writing and you want to have some kind of process because what will happen often is let's say you have three partners. Um, they start a business and they get six months down the line 
and the business isn't going as well as they thought it would and they want to change directions and you know maybe this multi-billion dollar business idea you know really isn't going to happen it's going to be successful but not make a ton of money one partner stops showing up uh, or they you know they're barely working or something of that sort uh, if you have a written agreement in place then you have the ability to move that person out uh, there'll be a process that's there if you don't have a written agreement you often end up with what we call a zombie partner uh, and the problem is if there's no written agreement you have to rely on um, the law of wherever you're located whether it be a state a province a country whatever it is and those laws tend to not be particularly helpful <laughs> so what happens is lawsuits get filed everybody starts blaming everybody else you know over the the business not doing as well as it was and you have essentially usually end up with a judge sitting up there who knows almost nothing about your business trying to decide how to work it out and the end result is almost always that nobody is happy a ton of money is spent on lawyers um, you know and the business often can fail just because the founders become so disillusioned at that point um, you know that none of them are really interested in carrying forward with it and um, I've had this happen with you know businesses uh, people have come to me with businesses that were pretty successful and and just going through that whole process was so aggravating that um, they did end up um, you know, closing the business down or they separated, um, and all three went the different directions and, you know, tried to do their own thing. So getting something in writing, uh, even if it's just basic, uh, is incredibly important. It'd be the best money you ever spend if, you know, you go to a lawyer to get it done. Um, just because statistically you're going to have problems with at least one founder. Um, it's just very, very, very uncommon. Um, for a business to launch and all the founders to, to be happy uh, and work out you know, moving forward. So having some process for, for addressing those issues is just really critically important. Why won't the wild wide web not be so wild wide in the future? Uh, so the concept of uh, what some people call the splinter net, um, what we're seeing is uh, an evolution on the internet that um, – some people, some people think it's all right. Other people, uh, like myself, are pretty worried about. And what you're saying is, um, the World Wide Web is is kind of being cut up by governments. You're seeing governments reassert their authority, um, and in doing so, they're issuing laws and regulations that are effectively forcing um, companies and users, to some extent, to make decisions about where they want to operate. So the classic example right now is uh, in the field of privacy. Uh, in the European Union, you know, the General Data Protection Regulation, which goes into effect into May, this is a very, very restrictive privacy policy for businesses. It's great for users, great for individuals. Um, but basically what the regulation states is um, that before you collect or use data from somebody located in the EU, um, you know, you have to have a legal basis for doing so. And that gets into a discussion that gets pretty complex pretty quick. But a legal basis could be something like a – um, a legal requirement, such as a contract. So if you come to my site and you're going to purchase a course from me, that's a contract. So when you fill out the data for that transaction, I can hold that data because there's a legal basis for that. Uh, another form is something called legitimate interest, which nobody really knows what it means, um, including the people who apparently drafted the regulation. Um, <laughs> but it can be an ins instance when you, maybe you have fraud or something of that sort that you're trying to deal with. The most common approach is going to be to get informed consent. Informed consent is um, simply asking the user you know, for consent to use, uh, to collect and use their information. Now, that informed consent has to be granular, which means – um, you know, if we look at websites in, in Europe now, you often see a pop-up that talks about cookies. Um, you know, the site uses cookies to collect information. You know, by continuing to use the site, you agree to let us you know, do this. Well, you're going to see bigger pop-ups um, under the GDPR with the consent. The consent form is going to ask you, essentially say, well, here are all the different ways we're going to collect information from you. You have to agree to these. Please affirmatively agree and check the box and things of this sort. So it's going to be pretty, pretty heavy duty, pretty, you know, bureaucratic. Now, if you switch over to the United States, uh, there's no federal privacy law. There, there just isn't one. Um, what we do have are some uh, specialized laws. So, for instance, if we collect information from children, um, there's a federal law for that, or if it involves health data, something like that. But there is no general law. So in the U.S., U.S. companies are used to collecting information and monetizing it and doing so, you know, with very few limitations. And basically this is how Facebook and Google, um, you know, built their empires. Uh, they just sweep up vast amounts of information, monetize it and sell it off. Well, you can't do that in the EU anymore. 
Um, and so while Google and Facebook had the money to set up separate organizations and comply with the law in the EU, you know, a blogger um, or somebody with a small membership site, they don't. And so a question that starts arising is, well, do you geo-block the EU if you're a U.S. company? Um, you know, or do you try to go through those compliance steps? And what a lot of people are going to do is they're going to geo-block. And geo-blocking is just, you know, they're no longer going to allow traffic to come from the EU uh, to their website because the cost of compliance is so high, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and you're already starting to see this with other countries, Russia, um, you know, the, the popular business networking site LinkedIn for a long time hasn't been viewable in Russia because Russia was, requires companies to uh, maintain a server in Russia that contains all the data for Russian citizens that that site has. And Google and Yahoo comply with that, but LinkedIn does not. Um, I'm not sure if that's still going to be the case since uh, Microsoft purchased LinkedIn, but at least it was the case for a while. In China, China, they are getting rid of anonymity. Um, so a lot of the laws that are coming out of China are saying if you're going to join a site or, or just leave comments anywhere um, you know, on sites and what have you, uh, you're going to have to use your real name. And that's a big change from um, the, you know, the laws that you see across much of the rest of the world. It raises questions about, um, you know, does it limit free speech and things of this sort. Um, and so you're seeing this kind of just spread across the, the world in different areas. And I think that, um, you know, the governments are going to continue to do that uh, and how businesses comply with that and how individuals uh, that limits individuals access to information is going to be something you know to keep an eye on. Um, but it is definitely already starting, and it's it's something uh, that kind of imperils the idea of the World Wide Web uh, in the future. Wow. Okay. Tell us um, your, about your internet law program. Uh, so I'm an internet lawyer. I work with um, international business, well, international businesses from the U.S. perspective, so businesses that, that want to tap the U.S. market. Uh, I'm in San Diego, California. Uh, you can always find me through my uh, website, which is SoCal, like Southern California. SoCalInternetLawyer.com, or you can just do a search for my name, Richard Chapo. It's fairly unique that uh, you aren't going to see too many other people listed. Uh, and just contact me. I'll be happy to talk to you about any legal needs you have. Uh, who can use your, your company or your program? Um, anybody who's tapping the U.S. market in the U.S., if you're a lis listener in the U.S., um, I only take clients in California, um, but most people can find internet lawyers in their area these days, or quite a few more uh, than there were 20 years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, contact me, and if nothing else, I, mean, I can possibly help you find somebody in your area. Uh, but if, yeah, your business is located outside of the U.S., then certainly contact me. And then I generally only work with businesses these days. Okay. So, Glenn, there will be more from Richard in a moment if you are listening on one of the many podcast platforms rather than my website and you are encouraged by Richard's journey. Go to onlinesuccessjourney.com for a bonus portion of the interview. The Online Success Journey is a wonderful membership community built for people searching for the path to success. We are one big clan and you will be part of this community for free. Once you have joined the clan, click on part two of Richard's journey or over a hundred other journeys that are available and you learn how you can find the right path for your own online success journey. That's a wrap clan. Remember, success is a journey. Patience and Richard. This is not the end of the journey. We hope you've enjoyed listening to part one and want to be sure you know there is a second part to this and every journey podcast at onlinesuccessjourney.com filled with even more success tips, uplifting stories, and even a bit of fun. There are dozens of episodes only available to the members of the Online Success Journey clan. Check out the website and click on Join the Clan for more information. Patience would like to thank you for listening to this podcast, and she has a free audio gift for you at her website. Go to OnlineSuccessJourney.com for instant access to this gift. Of course, you know that listening to the journeys of others helps each of us chart our own path. So make sure you're subscribed to be notified as each new interview is posted. There are so many ways to stay connected to the online success journey and to listen in. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we appreciate your help in telling others. One of the best ways to share the benefit you get is to rate and review it at Stitcher and other sites by clicking the stars or completing the ratings form. 
by clicking thumbs up and leaving a comment on YouTube or liking and sharing the podcast on social media. To review the podcast within iTunes, simply open iTunes to the podcast, click on Ratings and Reviews, then write a review. On behalf of patients and until next time, thanks once more for listening. It is our hope that this podcast will guide you on your own online success journey.